Mic check, one, two. Hi, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for coming down to uh the, to Hacker School today. Uh, so I'm Isaac from the from Newscast. Uh, and today we'll be doing a presentation on the uh on how to like involve uh, 3D printing with our uh, cosplay together. Oh. Test, 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 no. test. Maybe it needs to be closer to your. It, it's on now. It's on. Also, mic check. One, two, one, two. Test, test, test. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, hi, yes, sorry. Uh, thanks so much for coming out tonight. I'm Isaac from Newscast, and tonight we'll be talking about uh how to integrate 3D printing into your cosplay projects. So um. Moving on with slides, right? So for tonight, right, this is our program outline. Uh, we're going to be talking about the importance of character design, the iconic characters, and how to integrate um their cos their costume into your cosplay uh components. Um, we're going to have a tutorial on how to use Blender to model such components, and as well as a hands-on session for you to get to know how to use Blender. Uh, and hence, that's why we told you guys to uh stand by Blender on your laptops for today. Uh, afterwards, we'll be talking about how to print a 3D model and as well as how to post-process your print, uh, basically processing your components to make sure it's ready for your cosplay items. Uh. So without further ado, I'll be handing the time over now to Leon to talk about the uh, design. Thank you, Isaac. Hey, everyone. Are you guys doing all right tonight? I didn't ask you to clap. Oh, but thank you for clapping. Oh, anyway, okay. All right. So anyway, we'll be talking about character design right now. <clears throat> We're going to preface all the, the Blender modeling stuff uh, with a little bit of character design, all right? So basically, I'm going okay, to be straight right now. I'm going to preface this with a few things. Firstly, this is not a course to tell you exactly like how to create the best character design ever. Because I'm a person, I'm human, you guys better take whatever I'm going to say with a grain of salt. Also, second thing, there's not going to be a lot of stuff to like, you know, see on the slides. It's going to be the bare minimum because firstly, I want to make this like for, for everybody. That is to say, if you're not confident with your character design, you can listen up, take your own notes. Secondly, if you're already confident about character design, I suggest that you uh, listen to another perspective, all right? All right, let's move on. So what we'll be going through today, uh, firstly, the design considerations when we are creating a character design, that's to do with uh, these three things, very simple, all right? And we're also going to be giving examples for each of those, all right? Okay, so uh, I'm just gonna uh, give you some of my credentials. I'm an artist. I've done character design ever since like, oh, and actually when did I do the character design? Since, anyway, very young. I did it when I was very young, all right? I did some of my work. This is my, some of my more recent work. Yeah, other stuff. This one is more of a sketch. All right, so uh, my, first, uh, my first point. When you want to create character design, consider the flow of the vision. What I mean by this is that you look at the character, what are you most drawn to, all right? So if you say, oh, I like Mickey Mouse's character design, right? What are you looking at? You're looking at his two big ass ears, right? So what we actually mean by flow of vision is that it's just fancy way of saying composition. You want the composition to be good. So ask yourself these important questions. Number one, what part of my character am I supposed to be focusing on? Okay, guess. Okay, for the guy on the left, he's doing this from Overwatch. Guess what part of the character design you're even focusing on? Uh, I'm guessing you're not going to say his feet, right? The BFG, all right, whatever. Okay, second thing. Where are the details centered around? The thing when you're making a character design is that you don't want it to be uniform throughout. You don't want it to be homogenous. You want them to look at your character and they want to say, oh, I like that part of the character, right? Because when you say, I like that part of the character, this means that they were paying attention. They really like took home something from your design. So for the guy on the left, Doomfist, you say, oh, he's got a big ass arm. I love his big ass arm. And it's also full of gold and details. It's all over there. My eyes are drawn to it. All right? And uh, second, third one, most importantly, you make your design, ask yourself, do your eyes hurt? If your eyes hurt, you are doing something wrong. Because obviously, you want people to look at you, right? You, then you don't want their eyes to hurt. Okay, so besides Doomfist, the, um, on the right is my wife uh, from Street Fighter 3, Makoto. All right, you, you might be looking at her and you're like, okay, uh, character design, she's just wearing like a gi and a uh, black belt. Like, where's the character design in that? And why does it have to do with like the flow of vision? All right, what I say is that look closer around her neck. All right, look closer around her neck. What is that? 
It's a yellow archer. You probably can't see because of the goddamn thing in the way. Nah, you won't get it. Anyway, there is like a yellow band around her neck. And what is there for is that because the character designers of Street Fighter 3 know that her design was so simple to begin with, in order to...
My test, my test. Uh, my test, can you all hear me? Ah, yes. Last one, can you hear me? Oh, it's good. I don't know how to say that, by the way. Just no, no particular reason. Anyway, all right. So now to the blender portion. So why do we need blender? Because we talk about a lot of all these great designs, right? So we talk about like why what makes the design great, like and how to create great designs yourself. But what are these great designs in your own mind, right? Or you want to recreate a great design you've seen somewhere else in some franchise, in your brand franchise, for example. You want to like recreate a yeah, so yeah. Say you have a great design yourself, you have a great idea, they want to put the paper, or you have something that you really like to, like to do. You really want to make a design from a, your favorite franchise into reality. But how do you bridge that gap from the idea in your head into reality, into a physical, into a physical print that you can use in your cosplay? And kind of look up to the printer and go like, I will it to happen because that's not how it works. So Blender is the gap. Blender is meant to bridge the gap between the design of your mind and the actual 3D printable thing, right? It's meant to convert your design to your head into something that's concretely 3D printable and let the printer know how it's, how it's being printed, right? So essentially, Blender is a 3D modeling software that allows you to model stuff in 3D with a lot of freedom and a lot of uh, options for, to, for you to use. Yeah, yeah. so you convert the design in your head into a 3D printable model. But now, right, you may ask, why, why do you choose Blender specifically? There's many other options on the market. Like, you know there's Autodesk, Ma Autodesk Maya, like AutoCAD and Fusion 360, but why Blender specifically? Well, many reasons, for example. Many of these uh, available market uh, products are geared towards more engineering roles, such as 360, which is geared towards more engineering products, right? As an engineer can testify, right? More stress testing, more precision gears, but for something more artistic, Blender takes the wheel. And because Blender allows for many different artistic, uh, many different, uh, have, have many different use, useful tools to create artistic models, such as half surface modeling, which is what we're doing today, right? As well as sculpting, which is another very powerful tool offered in Blender. And slightly, uh, yeah, slightly not as relevant for 3D printing, we also have texturing and many other different useful art features in Blender. Yeah. So on top of this, why, but what's the biggest reason that we're gonna choose Blender? Well, because it's free, right? This is our favorite word, right? It's free. But on top of being free, it's not just free. Blender is also open source. Right, so I'm using the tech nerds here, just collectively just all get on the word open source. And why, open, why is open source good? Because open source allows us to, open source means that this software is not just free for now, but means free forever, as long as this uh, software is on, on the internet. And not just that, we also allow to make our own amendments, our own changes to the software, and either through our own means or through the given API. And this allows us to automate certain tasks in Blender, such as scripting with Python, or even making our own changes, our own plugins to the software itself making our software much more ext extendable and much more user-friendly and creating much more options, much more freedom for the user to explore around. Right. So now that that's said and done, now we know why we, why, why we should choose Blender. So now let's take a dive to Blender ourselves and let's try our hand at modeling something of our own in Blender. So to get started, I believe everyone has downloaded the Blender before coming here. For those who have not downloaded the Blender, the link to download Blender is on this uh, QR code as well. Right. So yeah. With that, so everyone can just open their blender and get ready for the modeling session. Yeah. Yeah. So another question is, what exactly do we make? Well, I just want to make something something grand, right? So I believe we sent a survey with, with asking y'all what y'all want to see that's made. Asking y'all what y'all want to see made during this session. And there's a lot of great responses like helmets. I used someone say parasynicals like avatar or something, which unfortunately there's many, many brand ideas that, that was proposed. Sorry? Watch it all cute. That's very simple. Yeah. So there's many very simple ideas and many great ideas for this. But in terms of strength, we do something rather simple today. And what's more iconic than the most popular game recently, Genshin Impact. And we're doing Brighton's vision for Genshin, for our modeling session today. Yeah. All right. So that's it. So may I head on to the uh, QR code link here? In the QR code link, you see a link tree. And in, in the link tree, you see several things. One of the link is the Blender guide, which shows the rough outline of today's uh, Blender modeling session. Other than that, there's also a link towards the uh, uh, startup uh, reference images inside as well. So y'all can use this as a reference in the link tree. Yep. So y'all can take time to scan this thing while I change over my presentation to our Blender. Yeah. Oh. Apologies for the slip up. The it would appear that our oh, yeah. Is this working now?
So, all right, so oh, yes. it's blending time. Okay, <laughs> right, okay, this is the part where, okay, so for this tutorial, right, we just put it along and as we model something together of our own. So, just a demonstration uh, to, show, to show that today I'll see what Blender can do. So, actually, one of my pressure projects recently during the last semester holiday was I tried to create this sword for an iconic character called. Uh, I actually have not opened it, but yeah. So I really wanted to recreate this character swap. So I went, so I went to recreate the character swap from scratch in Blender, and this is the result. So there are some parts where is it not showing? Yeah. Hmm. Oh yeah, sorry, never mind. So yeah, so this is one of my favorite characters uh weapon from one of my from one of my favorite games. Lah. So I created this one entirely from scratch from scratch inside Blender, and this is how this is one of the many possible things that you can do in Blender, right? So for today, we're gonna to make a Genshin region, the new the Inazuma region from scratch. All right. So have you ever scanned the link tree already? If you ever scanned the link tree, all right. Actually, before that, right. So, so first of all, starting off using Blender. So first of all, let's create a new Blender file just to start off with because that's the most that's the first thing you do. All right. So, when you create a Blender file, this is the first thing you see. Right. You see uh this cube, very nice cube in the center of the screen, as well as uh this thing, which uh this other thing, which thankfully you don't have to care about. So when you put them into Blender, well, this might look quite intimidating, right? Because there's, you see a lot of things, a lot of buttons on the side, top bar, this and that. Well, actually, right, the comforting, the comforting uh, fact is that, to be very honest, you don't need to know 80% of these features to, to model something that you want. Because a lot of this, because like we said before, Blender is such an extensible tool with many, many different tools or many, many different users. Your 3D model rigging, model sculpting, and model 3D modeling, for example. So for today, right, We'll be focusing mainly on our we we only we will only using two tabs out of all this thing on the top, right? Our layout and our modeling, which is what we're using for our 3D modeling here. Everything else here is actually very useful features, extendable features, but we'll be covering today, right? Those are our additional stuff, right? So for today, so when we first look into Blender, we see all this stuff, right? A cube, um, a cube, a camera, and a light. So for that, right, we're gonna just move everything first. Right, and let's get started with navigating Blender first. So yeah, we need to move this away. Right. So our first order of action is look, learning how to navigate Blender itself. So how do you navigate Blender? So, okay. All right. So, right. So yeah, I think y'all can see uh what. So I had a. I don't have a screencast key so I can see what my mouse is picking up. I know I'm pressing on the screen. So on the bottom right of the screen, you can see what button I'm pressing now. So you can follow along as well. Right. So to, so to zoom around the screen and to see what's happening on the, on the thing, you just press the middle mouse button and pan over and you can see what's going on. Right. While your right mouse button gives you options and your left mouse button is to select items to edit. So to begin, so what I'll go here today is to model a, it's not actually designed for our Genshin, for our Genshin Impact Vision, right? Sorry. Oh yeah. So what I'll go today is to create a Genshin Impact region. So first we need to know, we need to have a reference to model it based off of. We can, of course we are modeled based on memory, but that would be very ideal, right? Because there'll be a lot of errors and a lot of uh, inaccuracies probably. So we just use a reference source. So let's see. Okay. Okay, so let's find a reference source for our, All right, so if you go to the Genshin Impact Electro Vision, you see many useful ones. So such this one. So let's see, this is our second of, this is our second result where you search Google Images for Electro Vision. So let's use this one, right? Quite a good image. So let's save it. So we save the image as and we download it first. And then we just go to our downloads and yeah. Okay. And then we go to our blender. Then we simply import our we can simply import our image in Blender, but before we before we import the image in our Blender first, one thing first, when you import the image in Blender, the image will be rendered perpendicular to your user, user's view. So if our image will be perpendicular flat on the ground, ground per se in Blender. So how do you do that first? So one very useful thing is in Blender is this Gimzo, this uh Gimzo view. So you see on the top right, you this Gimzo can move around this Gimzo to kind of move the screen around. And the most useful part of this is that when you press on the axis, you can align yourself uh perpendicular to the axis. So in this way. This is an entire front view. So in the front of the x-axis, we are looking at the front of the of our modeling space, right? Similarly, 
Similarly, because of Z, these are our top-down view of the entire modeling space. So from here, right, we can import our photo of our electro vision. Okay, here. And ta -da, you see that when you import it, it's perfectly flat on the ground. Right. If not, right, just on going after you import it now. If you import it now, right, what, what you see is that your photo is kind of slanted, which is not exactly what you want. It's not very useful to have a slanted photo like this. So yeah. All right. So import an image like this. And yeah. And one of the most useful tools in Blender is uh okay. Because, so we have an object in your blender like this, right? The most important thing you want to know is the object's properties, right? So where the image is, where this image is, where this object is, and what's its properties, its rotation, its relative position, etc. So to see that, press N. Okay, so press N on your keyboard and see on the right side here, sorry. Yeah, on the right side here on the screen, you pop up a little window here that gives you the transform a window. So getting the details of all the items that's within our, think all the details of the item essentially, right? So from here, you can see that our item is actually not centered. It's located somewhere like in the top left-hand quadrant. So we can just highlight all three uh, axes and press zero. And just immediately center our, our photo to the center. Right? So we can use this as our reference image. But before we can begin modeling, so bear in mind, right, this entire 3D modeling session is meant for 3D printing. So when you 3D print, right, what's the most important thing when you 3D print? And then it's scale. We need to know how big our thing is when you print, right? If you want this vision to be like humongous, like this size, that'd be wrong. It can't be too small, like 2 cm by either. That'd be wrong. That'd be wrong also. So we must first tune our thing to be relative to be correct to the scale, right? So, so to make that scale correct, but the most important thing, right? Bear in mind, this is the most important thing when you 3D print. Change your unit scale. So you go to your right-hand side. You see your scene properties, which is your droplet here. Go inside that. Go to your unit scale and change your unit scale to 0 0.01. Because we're using centimeters for today's uh, demonstration. If you don't change this here, right, all your models that you design will be tiny in your 3D printer. And that's not good. All right? So change the unit scale first. Right, after you're done changing that, all right, let's take a look at our, let's, be, let's begin modeling proper, all right? All right. So, yeah. So when we start off modeling, right, we're gonna use, this, we're gonna use this, this image as a reference, but we don't want it to block our vision, right? So what I can do to this image first is that we go to the image options and we change the opacity to something that's a bit less, for example, 0 0.2. So you can see through this image when we model, right? And I don't want this to block our thing when we model, so you can make it, slightly above the level plane. So once again, back to our transform window, this controls all the coordinates and the details of this image. So you can change its x-axis position to something like 1 cm off the ground. So all this, <clears throat> as you see, right, all of our units here are in meters. So if I change this uh, location here to 0 0.1 meters, it's simply 10 cm off the ground. So if you change the size, you see something like this. It is about, so it's about 10 cm above the ground. La. So you can start using this as our reference image. All right, so now, Let's use this and model. So how do, you, how do you create a model based on this? Well, first of all, right, let's add the most basic building, building blocks to our model, lah, which, yeah, most, uh, most basic building blocks by using our add function here, or rather you can use shift A as well, right? Which gives us all the options of what we can add to the scene, right? And our most useful thing is mesh. So within mesh, right, we see all these beautiful things. We have a cube, for example, oh, that's huge. No, oh my God, there's a, two, there's a two meter by two meter cube, by the way, that is humongous. But we don't need that, instead, we want something that is relevant for our model here. In which case, we can simply use a cylinder, right? A lot more relevant. But this is too big again. So this is humongous and not really useful for our model. So by the state, right, when you create, when you add something to the scene, you can use our, if you go to the bottom left of our screen, we see a small window pop up. And this window pop up gives us the details of what we just added to the scene. So you open that window, you see the details of what we just added. And you can amend the details in the window. So for example, we added a cylinder and this cylinder has 32 vertices. It essentially shows us how smooth our cylinder is. Basically, the more vertices there are, the more smooth it will be. In this case, our, you see our, our cylinder is one, one meter across the radius and two meters tall, which is bigger than me, basically. Not great. So our vision is quite small, right? So we want our vision to be small. So in this case, we can change our thing to, let's try a 0 0.02 cm radius with a 0 0.02 with a 0 0.1 cm, with 1 cm height, a 2 cm radius and 1 cm height. And let's see how it looks. Something like this, well, so you see, uh, so now we have a 2 cm uh, cylinder and 1 cm height, a cylinder of 2 cm radius and 1 cm height here. 
right? So how do you manipulate this now? So first thing first, right? We know that this cylinder here is two cm wide and one cm tall. So right off the bat, we know that our picture here is too small already because our vision, our vision right now is about two cm in uh in diameter, which is not great, right? So we need to scale this vision as well. So to scale this vision, we can approximately change its size to let's scale up by two times, right? Let's see how it goes. So you can so start to scale something up by all dimensions. You can simply select all three scales by highlighting all of them. So like that, we highlight all three. Then we simply change the value here from 1.0 to 2.0, for example. And boom, it's double the size. Or rather, four times the size because, you know, squaring the sound math works. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So with that, we have a slightly bigger uh, Genshin vision. Now we can do our modeling proper. So for our cylinder, right? So we want this cylinder to model the, the vision itself. So let's begin with the easiest part, the easiest part to build, which is the entire frame of the vision. So creating the vision frame, let's see, we have a cylinder that's uh, about the size of the overall uh, cylinder here, of the overall uh, circle here, right? So but our cylinder here is too small. What do we do now? We can simply scale it, right? So to scale, uh, to scale our object, you can simply press S. If you press S, you see it's being scaled. You can drag it around and it become bigger, smaller, and you can scale it, right? So you want to scale it to something that is slightly big enough. And then, but now it's not centered to our reference image. And that's not great either. So to send it to our reference image, we can move it around in our screen by pressing G. G for grab. So you can grab the image. You can scale the image with S, grab the image with G. So now you grab the image and you can move it around the screen. Right. But I don't want to move around too much either. I want to keep it stable, right? So when you press, so you're not pressing G and simply moving around, we can press G followed by the axis. So in this case, we're going to move it along the Y axis. So you can press G followed by Y. So in this case, you can only move along the y-axis. So now it's a lot, a lot more stable and a lot more clean, right? So a lot easier to measure where, where our things are going, right? So let's move our thing along the y-axis a little bit and let's see. So I'm going to the center here, right? And then let's scale up a little bit again, like that, yeah. So it's something, this kind of makes up the main body of the vision now. So great, we have, the main, we have the main frame of the vision up. So let's make the details first, All right? So another thing to notice that once we scale up the vision, right, our we are scaling our y axis also. So, right now, our uh, cylinder here, our block here is actually a chonker at 2 cm tall, which is not exactly ideal because that means our vision is this thick, which is too thick already. So, you can simply change that and change it back to 0 0.1 cm tall, make it a lot more manageable. Right? Actually, I think our vision can be, can be half an mm also, honestly. It can be, sorry, it can be 5 mm also. So, 0 0.05, a 5 mm disc for our vision. All right. So, we have the main body of the vision now. So. Let's create a smaller disk for this as well. So we can add a mesh, right? We can add a circle. Okay, that's not a circle. We can do the same, we can bring the same process and we add more and more cylinders. So in this case, then it remembers our previous selection already and creates a smaller cylinder for us. So in this case, let's move our let's move our cylinder around and let's, let's try something of one cm diameter in this case. Looks good. All right. So let's now now, now let's move it towards uh now let's grab it and shift it towards our top circle here. Right. We grab it, then we press Y, and then we shift it to somewhere around here. And then now we scale it up again, so that it's around the right size for the top circle. Looks good, right? So yeah. Small issue is that, notice, right, for a lot of reference images we come across is that, you know, one thing, one important thing we notice is that the reference images is actually not perfect themselves. So case in point here, this reference image, this reference image is actually not perfectly centered. So even though this reference image looks proper enough, you see that small, some small detail is not perfectly centered because we know that our model is perfectly centered to the screen. But even so, right, this uh, round circle on the reference image is a bit slanting off to the right. So we mean that it's not our own model that's slanted. It is reference image that's slanted. So it's important to know not to overcorrect to fit the reference image, but to follow your own structure in your 3D modeling. Right? So now we can copy this cylinder, we make two of that, then we grab it by the y axis. Grab it the x-axis and we shift it around. Then we scale. Oh, then we scale it down to six. Right. So one, this two. Right. So we can two. And then we can replicate this again with Control C, Control V. So Control C, Control V. Same thing as our word document lah. Uh, copy the object and and generate a similar one. So we copied our smaller cylinder we created here, and then we simply grab it and shift it towards our right side again with our along the, now along our x-axis, right? onto this smaller circle. Very nice. All right. So now the main shape of our region kind of kind of something looking like it a little bit, but it's still very far from the actual thing. So first of all, let's cut out the main frame of vision first. So right now we notice that vision is actually a round frame around the main crystal itself. But our 
model here just one big cylinder block. And that's so I'm going to cut out the center here. And how do you cut out the center here? That's where we go into our blender system pro proper because it introduces a very important, a very useful workflow when using Blender. So when doing hard surface, so what we're doing currently in Blender is called hard surface modeling, which as the name suggests, we are modeling hard surfaces, right? And in hard surface modeling, one very common workflow is called Boolean workflow. And what is it called Boolean workflow? Let me show you. So look at the reference image. We see that we have an overall big circle here, but I want to cut out the smaller, we want to cut out the smaller portion inside. So how do you do that? You can simply add a mesh with a cylinder. And we scale this to be in line with the one in the center, right? Like this. It's a bit big. And we just grab it along the y-axis a little bit. Right. So this looks like some this looks quite aligned with our yeah. This, okay. We can scale up a little bit more. Grab a little bit. Yeah. Just a little bit of fine-tuning, right? So 3D, 3D modeling is half art and half science. Lah. A lot of it is also a little bit of aggregation while still trying to maintain, try, while still trying to keep it as clean and neat as possible, right? So in this case, we have our overall frame, which is this cylinder, which is this cylinder, right? This highlighted cylinder. We don't have our inner frame, we don't have to cut out in this cylinder. So the reason why we call this workflow Boolean workflow is because we can simply take our cylinder inside and Boolean it with this one. So what we do here is that we select the outside cylinder, which is our main frame that you want to keep. Go to your modifier properties and you can add a modifier. And as then generate, look for the Boolean modifier. Right. And what Boolean does that, you can simply do different, like, you know, you, okay, seeing is believing. So what you're gonna do here is just select the we're gonna select the operand and we're gonna select the inner new thing. And what happens is uh yeah, so what happens when you press apply? Okay, so now we have done the now we've done the Boolean modifier, right? What happens when we hide the inner cylinder? Ta-da! We have cut out the center of our, our outer cylinder, right? So this way we can create a frame of our vision. And the reason why this Boolean workflow is so versatile and so good and so useful is because our Boolean workflow allows us to create complex shapes while from simple shapes. We don't have to, do, we don't have to use many different complex tools. We think by using simple shapes, we can simply combine them or difference them together using our Boolean workflow to create more complex shapes. In this case, for example, we can create a skewed uh, pipe, right? Using our Boolean workflow here. So you can simply just press apply on a modifier and that change is set in stone. So this has been confirmed already. Our big cylinder has been cut, has been has a whole cut into it now. Right. All right. So now we're gonna create the smaller details. So as you notice, right, our bit, our vision here has a groove along the outer ring as well. So let's create a ring as well. We also using the Boolean workflow. So let's create a, another cylinder. Oops, not looking from the top. Let's also scale it. So, oh my God. Oh my God. Come back. All right. So, somewhere around here is a bit big. Then we grab it. Then we scale it, move along the y axis. Oops, grab y. Then we try to fit it to the thing. Yeah. So, we scale a little bit. It can be a little bit bigger, I think. Yeah. So, really, make sure, we just need to make sure it doesn't cut into the outer uh, thing. The outer thing. Yeah. So now we can do the same thing. Then we can create the inner ring. Yeah. Yeah. So something like this. So now, right, we notice that is. Okay. Oops. I slightly screwed up there. So. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so what we want to do is want to, what we want to do here is that we want to cut out this uh this little uh, indented place around the outer frame as well. So to do that, let's create more cylinders to create to create a cutter for this, right? So with that, we can create a cylinder of this size. We scale it up. We uh we scale this up a little bit, right? So that it makes the outer ring, right? And then we control C, control V. This we make a smaller one, and then we this is the inner bit of the ring. Right. So so when you okay when you scale something right notice so for every operation that we do on the bottom left there's always this uh detailed screen that allows us to con to have primary control over our operation. So we have a scale operation right for example we want to scale to a perfect 0 0.9 a uh, 90 percent of our original scale we can simply go up to here to our scale and press 0 0.9 so our new model will be as actually 90 percent of the original model right so 
Now we're gonna move out of this one, we're gonna grab it, move it. Oh, sorry. We're gonna take our smaller one, we're gonna grab it, we're gonna move it slightly further down. Okay, sorry, yeah. So when you, right, when you scale this one, you want it to be, let's say 0 0.95, 95%. That look good. Okay, so. So we're gonna scale this up a little bit. Let me make it a little bit bigger, 1.1 maybe. Okay, no. Oh, sorry. So that's 1.05. Okay, something like this. So we have two small cylinders inside. Then we take this one. Then we grab it a little bit along the y-axis. Then we make it like that. So, so now we see we created this uh trope area within our within our frame, right? But now, how are we gonna pull in all of this together? It's going to be quite annoying, right? We're going to have to take this. We're going to have to apply a Boolean modifier to it. We're going to select the one, we're going to select the one inside, et cetera, et cetera. Then we, okay. Then we, we select the item here. We apply. Then we do the same thing again and again, which is quite annoying. So we introduced a shortcut in Boolean workflow, right? So for Boolean workflow, there's a very easy shortcut called Boolean uh, in our add-on. So go into our preferences. And let's go to our add-ons in preferences, right? So our preferences, we can add a very useful tool called uh, bool tool. So what bool tool does for us is that it allows us to cut and it allows us to apply our boolean modifier through a very simple hotkey. Three keys, we can do what, what we do here in our modifier, which is a lot slower, right? So add our bool tool here. Once that is added, notice that when you press Control Shift V, this thing comes out, which is your bool tool. So it's not having to use the modifier, right? Which is a lot slower and a lot more clunky. This hotkey allows us to use our bool tool a lot faster and directly access our boolean tools. Within a, with a simple hockey. So in this case, we're gonna create a cutter for our troll, right? So in this case, we're gonna take our, oh shoot. Right, so we're gonna take this, and we're gonna take this. So to use our boolean tool, we can simply select both objects together. So we select the overall object, then select the smaller object in the center, right? With shift. Now we select the both objects already, right? To apply boolean to the, to the both of them, we can simply control shift B to be sense of boolean. Right, and all these Boolean options come out. So the one that we want to use is difference, right? Because, oops, that is the wrong difference. Yeah, so we're going to use difference because we're going to create this ring that cuts upon us the, uh, this design on the, we're going to cut this design out on the vision, right? So we can create this ring with our Boolean tool, right? I could simply do that by selecting both objects together, pressing Control Shift B and applying difference, right? But sometimes when I screw up the ordering, so what happens if you screw up the ordering? What happens when you screw up the ordering? What happens is this. Sorry. What happens is this. You get a wrong boolean. This is not what you want. You don't want two flat this here, but you want, some, you want the cone, right? So what happens is that the order where you select the objects when you apply Bluetooth is very important as well, right? So the one that you want to keep is you select, the, you select the one you want to keep later. So in this case, I want, to, I want to discard the one inside. I want to keep the one outside. So in this case, I... So I select the one inside first, then select the one outside. Then I use our blue tool here, difference. Then I get a cone that you can use to cut our thing, right? So in this case, we have a cutter here. So what? So when you notice, right? Okay. As you, as you use them, the one very tool habit to have is to name our things properly. So in this case, right? We haven't really named our things as we move along. So then, now let's move up. Let's name our things a bit properly so we can keep track of what's going on. Come back down, as you notice, right? We have six cylinders in our collection already. And now, I don't really know which one of them is which, right? But there's six cylinders hanging around. I have to actually click on, click on each of them to know which one is which cylinder. So to properly differentiate, we can simply name them. So for example, this one, we can name them the main body, right? For example. And then for example, we can name this the top, oops. We can name this the top circle, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the right circle, this is the left circle, and we can call this, but what do you call this one? So one thing where you use to apply the boolean tool. So okay, first thing first, let's apply the boolean tool to our main body first, right? So let's move this up a little bit. Let's grab V. Let's make this cut into our thing by around half. Let's say so we move it up a little bit, and let's cut into our main body by around this bit, right? Then we apply boolean tool to the to the both of them, right? There is like both of them. Then we apply boolean tool. Difference. So now we have this design cut out in our, uh, in our design here. So it's good, right? But what's the problem here? What if, what if you want to make this cut again? I want to make slight, slight changes to the cut. Then what happens? What, so what we're going to do here is right, we're going to keep, we want to keep a copy of the cutter that we used before. So in this case, 
I was thinking here is called the cutter. I'm going to keep a copy of this cutter. So we can call this cylinder here main body cutter, for example. And we create a collection, a new collection, and we call this collection our cutters. So in our Boolean workflow, having a collection of our cutters is very important because our cutters is essentially the things that we remove from our main model to create a model. In this case, we create a copy of our cutter, right, inside our cutters, and then now we Boolean this two. Right, now we Boolean these two together with different. Oops, not the wrong button. Oh, I think it's the wrong button. Yeah, so. Yeah, so. Yeah, we have created our trove, but also, but also maintaining our cutter that we used before. Okay. So now this, this part done. So. As we are running out of time, I'm going to slightly truncate everything. So I'm going to move on to more important parts. We're not going to fully, fully finish the video by today, unfortunately, due to time constraints. But I'll try to, I'll try to cover all the basic skills needed to finish the model in our own free time, right? So, so another important thing is that noticing our top three things here. So we create our, our indented face or our face. So one easy thing you can do is we can move our photo outside of our collection. So this collection is our actual vision, right? Then we can, so when we, want, when we don't want our vision to interfere with our the face, we can simply set our eye icon here to hide it. So now we can't see it anymore. Now we can only see the photo. So now we observe the photo, right? We see that we kind of want to create this uh, indented uh, pattern on our three cylinders here, right? So how do we create this indented pattern? So let's go to our thing here. First of all, the three of them, let's change their height. Right now their height is around uh, too tall. I don't know how tall it is, but it's too tall. So let's change our, so let's scale it. Let's scale this vertical, scale, and press V to scale on the vertical axis. And let's scale it to around 60% uh, of the original size. Maybe that'll be good. So right now its height will be uh, just nice. Uh, 7 mm tall. Actually, you know what? Let's keep it to, let's keep it to 7 mm. Oops, that 70 cm. Yeah, 7 mm. Let's make this 7, 7 mm also. Similarly for this, 7 mm. All right, so, okay. Now, right, we notice this very, very, okay. So how do you create this indented phase pattern? So to create this indented phase pattern, right, we can simply take our thing. So now introducing edit mode. So right now we've done everything in our object mode. So looking at our top left, we have object mode, right? The more important, another important feature in our in, in hard surface modeling is our edit mode. So edit mode gives us, a lot, gives, us, gives us a lot more options to edit our objects, basically. So when you press, you can press tab to shift between object mode and edit mode. So press tab. And you see this, right? And this allows us to make edits to the object. And we can select different aspects of the object by our top three options here. We, right now, we are, we are in vertex selection mode where we select the vertices. We can also select the edges, right? We select some edges that we want to choose. Or we, go, we can also select faces in our face select mode. So now we want to choose our face select mode. And in our face select mode, we want to use our, we want to use one possible option, which is insert faces. Our, and our insert face is here. The, the hockey for that is very simple. It's simply I, and you press I, and you can insert the face here. Let's make this face about uh, 0.2 mm thick, right? And then now we have a face here. Now we, create, now we want to create an indent, right? What I can do here is to create another face from the face inside. And for this face, right, let's make the uh, thickness 2 mm as well. But now in this case, we want our depth to be non zero. So we can give it a 2 mm depth also, which Oh, as you can see, this is too, this is too deep already. So we can make it a little bit uh, thinner. One mm depth, for example, with a slight shorter thickness of maybe one mm or so. So now we look at our thing. Our, we create an indented face that's very similar to what our vision looks like. Right? Yeah. So we can repeat the same process as well for our other two objects. We press, we press tab to go to edit mode. Uh, select the face that we want to change. Press I. Then we can simply make changes to it. Right. Then we press I again. And we create our indents for our our two different disks also. Right. Okay, so now that I'll leave the last one. I'll leave the last one. I'll leave another exercise to everyone now because we have enough time already. So the next important thing is here our these two parts, our these two dangling parts, right? So to, how do you create those? So by creating those, right, I'm going to introduce uh, two other important concepts, which is your uh, layer cut as well as your Proportional edit. So in this case, let's create a small one. So let's create a one cm cube, right? 
So let's take our SM cube and make some edits to it. So in this case, our, let's see, our thickness should be, our, the thickness of our cube should not be 1 cm. It's too tall already. So in this case, let's change it to 5 mm. And let's move it to where it's supposed to be. So we grab it and move it here. And then you can rotate our object as well. We can press R to rotate our object. And by pressing R, we rotate the object around the center. And now we can rotate to fit, the, to fit our object. Now then we move it again to make it fit. And yeah, there we go. We have created this part of the object. But now, now right, this is only a square. But I want this thing to be this entire dangling thing of our vision, right? So how do you, how do, you do that? So one very cool thing is that your grab tool, right, can move the object around in 3D space, but your grab tool can also move certain part of the object around. So go into edit mode. While selecting your square here, go into edit mode and select the face facing the vision. What you can do here, right, you can simply grab the face and move the face around. And now you can edit this object. You can edit the shape of the object. And this is quite useful because now I can elongate the object without changing, without adding more vertices, right? So I'm going to grab this uh, face. I'm going to shift it closer towards the vision here. But I can see, right, doing it by hand is very accurate. We create, I dragged it by hand and I created this very ugly uh, drag. And that's not ideal. So how do you do this nicely and precisely? So you can grab this, right? And press Shift Z. What Shift Z does that? It locks it to the X and Y axis. And it wouldn't be grabbed in the Z axis. Right, so this shift only occurs in the x and y axis. So let's move it to around here, right, which is about where your line is to. Right. And you see that this is perfectly aligned to the, to the x and y axis. It's not shifted along the z axis. So since that takes away the z axis of the even. But now this is too big. We're going to change, we're going to make this more fitting to what our image sees, right? This is too big already. So let's make this smaller by taking the face. Once again, right, what I can do to the object, I can do to part of the, part, part of the object as well. So we can scale the object. We can do the same to a face. So we can scale the face as well. We can press S. While selecting the face, we press S. And we can simply uh, scale the face. But this is not good also because we scale the face in all axes. Now our thing is a bit too small, uh, thickness wise as well. And that's not great either. So what I want to do instead is we press scale and we press Shift Z again. So this way we lock, the, we, lock our ship, we lock our scaling to our X and Y axis also. So this way our thickness is preserved, but our, our thinness is uh, shrank. So this way, you can, let's see. It's a little bit too small, so let's remove that. So let's see. Right, we can make it somewhere like this, and then we grab the face again, shift Z, and we make it something like that. Yeah, something like that, right? But when you, when you observe the vision, right, when you look at our photo here, we see that this thing actually kind of protrudes out, right? When you get vision, these two parts actually overlay of, of each other. There's a slight angle to it. And what our vision here does is that it's actually flat. And that's not good, right? We don't want this thing to be flat. We want this thing to slightly come out a little bit. Something like this, but we want to give it an angle to it. We want to give it a slope. We don't want it to be directly straight. So how do you do that? Well, first of all, right, we can't make this thing have a slope because there's not enough vertices on it to give it a slope. So let's give it enough vertices first. So you can simply set our loop cut uh, option here. So in edit mode, go to our object edit mode and go to our loop cut on your top and your left bar. Loop cut gives you additional vertices, and you can simply select loop cut, and yeah. So yeah, you can press loop cut, and then in the bottom left, you can select how many cuts you want. So in this case, let's give it a little bit more cuts. Let's give it 16 cuts. So it's more, you know, well spread out throughout the entire thing. So this way, now when we grab the, okay, now we go to our object mode, and we grab the face here. So we grab the face here. And we press G, I'm going to shift it around. Oh no, this is not what we want. This really, we are only moving the one face and the next face is attached to. However, now we can introduce an idea called uh, proportional edit. So on the top bar, right, you see this uh, circle thing. So when you press it, proportional edit is enabled. And what proportional edit does is that it drags the things alongside it in proportion as well, like the name suggests, right? So when this happens, you can, you can see that the other vertices near it moves as well, right? And that's what we want. So you can simply uh, press proportional edit and then what proportion I did by pressing this button here, and then we can drag it around. And let's see. So our proportion size here determines how big our, how many things get affected. So the bigger it is, the more things get affected, and, and the smaller it is, well, the lesser the lesser the area of effect, right? So in this case, you can some, put it around, let's say, four, right? Then you try to grab the thing. Then you see that just like this, our area of effect affects pretty much the entire thing, right? So that's pretty good. So let's say, let's give it a, let's give it a vertical height of, uh, 2 mm, right? Let's shift it up by 2 mm. But we want this, when we shift it up, right, we want our curve angle to be, to look nice. We don't, we don't want to give it this weird, uh, 
we're gonna give it this weird uh weird angle. We're gonna create something that is more more smooth. So in this case, right, for our proportional edit, we can change how our thing uh moves as well with our proportional fall off. We change how our curve shifts. So in this case, we can try out different things like random definitely not gonna, not gonna work well. Constant is weird. Let's try sharp. So sharp gives us a very nice curve upwards, right? So we can use this one. So this gives us a very nice uh sun angle to our to the, to, the, to that part of the vision. Right. So yeah. So yes. Okay. So by right, right, the plan for today was that I'm supposed to I'm technically I think I'm supposed to finish modeling the entire vision by end of today's 20 minutes. But I don't think I'm able to because of time constraints. So for now, I'll stop here. But because I've covered most of everything that I'm supposed to cover today for Blender, so most of the basic techniques for Blender has been covered today already, including your Boolean workflow, your, your different tools that I did more, loop cards, moving, grabbing things, scaling things, etc., etc. So I'm with these tools, right? So the problem of this today's uh, Blender, uh, short Blender tutorial is not meant to make around experts in Blender. I myself am not an expert in Blender. I dare say that. I can only dare to claim myself as a begin as a beginner in Blender as well. But what's great about this sharing is no I'm sh sharing is no what I'm sharing here today. But I said the fact that there's so much accessible resources and we different ways also get into Blender, right? So I hope my sharing today give you all a little bit of a short introduction to Blender, so you're more comfortable exploring different things in Blender and you can navigate your way around the Blender itself. And other than that, what's the most important thing here today is not only what I'm saying here today, but the community we the community we have here in NUS Cast and NUS, NUS Hackers and having friends along us who can like do like share techniques with each other because the hardest part of doing Blender right is not actually figuring out things. The a lot of things a lot of doing Blender just simply going to online looking for resources, which is why in our link tree I also link a Blender guide giving us sharing many useful resources. A lot of the YouTubers there in the guide can explain everything I explain here much better than I can. But why are we here today then? Is because we can, we have friends, we have everyone here, right? And we can discuss of, we can discuss techniques and options with each other to make our to make learning Blender a lot easier, right? Because Blender is about learning things as you go along. No one is an expert at Blender because there's simply too much things to know, right? So I hope this is a short introduction to make y'all comfortable with using Blender. So with that, now we move on to a very short break where y'all have a little bit of chance to play around with Blender and try to make what you designed previously in your previous portion a reality in Blender. Or you can simply try to design something that you've seen that you really like in some other franchise. So yeah. So we have our break until um, 8.30, right? So a short 10 minute break for y'all to just uh, go around. And there'll be like refreshments for there as well by NES Hackers. So thank you NES Hackers for the refreshments for added. Yeah. So 10 minute break until... 8.30, where we'll carry on with uh, the 3D printing portion and the details on how to 3D print our uh, what we design in Blender. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> There's NUS Hackers for the free pizza. Woo! So, you, I'm talking now, right? Can you hear the mic? You can't. Uh, you follow his instructions.
I try not to drop the pizza when you're eating it. Uh, I don't think we're actually supposed to eat here. <laughs> Let's try to keep the place clean. Thanks so much. Bitch.
Piss, 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 piss. Hello, hello. Just a reminder, if you drop any food, right, please remember to clean up after yourself. We want to continue using this venue for future workshops. Uh, don't worry about it. Yeah. Just save all the corners and parts. Yeah, at the end. Yeah, but, uh, after the
l o h e l l o Okay, so just now everyone has learned how to use Blender, and I assume you have some basic thing design already, right? So now let's get to the very exciting part of how do you actually make that thing? How do you make your 3D design become a real object in the physical world? Uh, this is a very general introduction to uh, the different manufacturing or like uh, just. Techniques to make things. Uh, this is by no means like a full-on tutorial to teach you how to exactly 3D print. So the focus will actually be on uh, a few general uh, accessible kind of manufacturing fabrication methods. Uh, some of which will include 3D printing, definitely 3D printing, as we have talked a lot about it. But then 3D printing is a very generic term for additive manufacturing. So before 3D printing became like popular, right? The most uh, common kind of man manufacturing technique tends to be the subtractive manufacturing, whereby you have a block of material and then your machining tool will just remove the material to leave what you want in the end there. These methods will include like CNC and then uh, laser cutting, water jet cutting, all these kind of like subtractive methods. And then the one that we are more interested in is 3D printing. And then there are a few major kinds of 3D printing. The first one is to actually melt plastic. So it's extrusion blade, extrusion uh, based. And then when you have like plastic filament, it will extrude out and then uh, you can mold it into any shape. So if you have like plate with a uh, like a 3D uh, pen before, it's essentially the same thing. It's just that the 3D pen is now not controlled by you, but then you put it on like a machine and then the machine will like very precisely move around to create what you want. And other than like printing plastic, another way that you can 3D print is also through resin. So for this resin method is actually using like a special kind of uh, light sensitive liquid. It can be either UV sensitive or like laser sensitive. And then what this does is that you will either use a laser or like a LCD screen to actually uh, solidify part of the liquid. So the parts that's being solidified will be left behind while the liquid part will be like, uh, flow, it will flow away. So that's how you can like also, that's another way to actually 3D print. So these two methods are both like very commonly found out in like hobbyists. Then there is also this uh, more exotic methods whereby if you have very special parts, like this more, more get towards like engineering, like even the 3D print like metal in metal, then what you will do is a kind of like powder based 3D printing. So this kind of printing, uh, normally you wouldn't be able to do it as a hobbyist. Normally you need to send to like some printing company. They have like those uh, industrial grade machines that are like very huge that can actually do this kind of like melting or like sintering of the powder. So as I mentioned just now, we'll be focusing on FDM printing. That means it's the plastic kind of printing and SLA as well as a bit of like laser cutting. So yeah, FDM 3D printing it has the lowest barrier to access. And then uh, for those who are not very familiar with what FDM 3D printing is, I have like prepared like a few videos here. So it's like kind of like a time lapse. Yeah, so this is like, this is a Prusa Mark III, and then this is a very i3 style kind of 3D printer that is very commonly found, as I will uh, introduce a few more that are also in this style. This style of printer is actually quite cheap and accessible. Uh, if you want like two, 300 SGD, you can actually get a machine already. And you can see here, what this machine does is it will like print layer by layer, and then you will just deposit the filament layer by layer on top of each other. And yeah, if you, uh, if you were to notice here, one important thing is that you see this uh, very flat and like a uh, big base at the bottom. The reason why we need this is that uh, because uh, the 3D printer relies on the fact that your print is going to be fixed on the build plate at a fixed position all the time. But then if you have a very, a very small contact surface area with the build plate, then your 
your like design might like suddenly just break off in the middle of the print if the area is too small because the larger your surface area the more like uh contact and like more bonding there is but then if there is less then naturally it might like break off or like because of some instability it might just like fall off so when you design when you when you when you design and then when you print it might you might have like different considerations i will talk more about that later So yeah, normally like if your thing has like a too thin neck or something, you will add like a base. And then after some post-processing, you can like piece things together. So a lot of times you don't print like one entire object. A lot of times you print like it in parts and then you uh, combine them together afterwards. So just a few more uh, time lapses. I'm probably going to 2x this in for like, because we don't have enough time. Yeah, so there are a lot of like print in place designs. So these are like very creative ways whereby uh, when you print, when you design, the thing is like all printed together so that you can print some impossible to uh, manufacture kind of uh, products because a lot of all this print in place is only possible with additive manufacturing. For subtractive measure manufacturing, because your tool can't get into the object to like subtract away the parts needed to make this happen, uh, traditional uh, manufacturing techniques cannot achieve this. So this is one big advantage to like uh, 3D printing is that it offers like a brand new uh, opportunity for like certain 3D designs. Yeah. And then you see this resin, this plastic is actually very like nice. Like it has like, it's like one roll of uh, filament that has like changing colors. So as you print, your filament will kind of like change color and then your end product will be of like, a different mix of colors. Yeah, all this like print in place, very flexible designs. Yeah, I think I'll show you here. Uh, okay. The other interesting one is actually uh, SLA resin printing. So if you look at this video, right, uh, you can see that it's, like printing in the opposite way of uh, what we saw just now is like your print is actually growing from like top down in a way. This is because it's using like the resin and then uh, there is the build plate, right? So the there is either laser or like LCD will shine and then it will only shine, it will focus only on the parts that is to be like solidified. So whatever that is being solidified will get attached to the build plate itself. Then naturally the parts that are not solidified, they, are, they remain in liquid form. So as the build plate rises, the liquid will just slowly drain away from the parts that are not supposed to be solidified. And then in the end, you can get like this. Uh, this is really good for like very fine details uh, because uh, for FDM 3D printing, a lot of times you are limited by the size of your nozzle because uh, your nozzle is the one that controls how fine you can like print. It's like your pen your pen you have a certain width, then it determines how small a uh, stroke you can write. And then for FDM 3D printing, your nozzle determines like how fine of a detail can you actually create on a 2D plane. And something that I think is pretty, is worth mentioning, uh, it's not really 3D printing, but then uh, it's kind of like a 2.5D manufacturing technique as well. It's for like very uh, quick and cheap kind of uh, prototyping or if you want to mass produce a lot of things, because while 3D printing is very flexible, one of the main downsides is that it's a very slow process. Like a very simple print can easily take an hour or two. But then for laser cutting, because it's just literally making cuts and then the laser is so powerful that it can just zip around in like no time, you can make like very uh, precise and like very quick 2D designs. This is very useful. Like let's say if you are cutting cardboard, if you have like, you are using cardboard to like make some uh, just trying to uh, test out like the fitting of your design or whatnot, or like your sizing of your certain like belt or something. If you were to be manually cutting, it can be quite tedious. But then if you were to use laser cut to cut your cardboard, it will be done in like within a minute or two, and then it will be much more precise than what you can do by hand. So one big advantage of 3D printing is that you can do it at home. 
if you are able to do it from the comfort of your home, it allows you to very rapidly uh, iterate through your design. And then if, you were, if your design is not going to work out, you will know it very, very early on. So for FDM is the one of the cheapest choice for hobbyists and especially for like cosplaying, I think it's a very popular option. And since like the mid 2010s, uh, there are a lot of uh, low cost machines that appeared on the market. And then although they are low cost, uh, they are still pretty powerful. Uh, I think this laptop needs charging. Yeah, so for things like create. Creality Ender 3, uh, it costs about, I checked just now, it costs about like 260 SGD. Uh, and I'm not too sure about the shipping, but like generally from like three 400 onwards, you can get like a pre pretty decent uh, i3 style kind of uh, um, 3D printer. So it's called i3 style because like this kind of printer, they have like this kind of uh, overarching frame and then the bit itself is the one that is like moving around. So like another name for it is like a slingshot printer. It's uh, it's one of the cheaper designs that you can find. Of course, this design has its own downside, which I will not get into. There are a lot of different uh, 3D printer designs that uh, each have their own advantage, but this is mainly because it's very cheap to build. And disclaimer is that uh, I'm not sponsored by these companies. Uh, if you are going to, if you intend to buy a 3D printer and toy around with it, do do your own research before determining what is best for you. And why FDM is good is one of the key advantage is there are a lot of material choices. While we are doing, while we say we are printing with plastic, actually plastic, there are a lot of different kinds of polymers. The one of the more common kind of polymers is like PLA, PETG, ABS is not so much because ABS is kind of like a toxic material and it's quite it's generally quite difficult to work with. And then for like the engineering students, they are you're probably like more interested in like uh nylon, carbon fiber infused kind of uh filament, those more exotic ones. But then PLA is very PLA and PETG, they are like very cheap. They are available in like a very wide variety of like colors. Like they are like translucent colors, they are like glow-in-the-dark colors, they are any colors under the sun you can think of that someone probably is producing that kind of PLA. And things like pet G, because it's like your pet bottles, they can very they can be very easily made like transparent. So if you have any kind of designs that's kind of like translucent, you might consider printing with uh, pet G. Although some PLA are also, so are also available in like uh, translucent colors. And because it's additive manufacturing, right? Uh, you don't get a very a mess of materials that's left behind because in order to manufacture your product, most of the time it's all the materials goes into your product. There is very little wastage and you can get relatively strong parts out of it. Yeah, and another fun thing is that uh, for FDM 3D printing, like if you have a lot of different colors, something that you can actually possibly achieve is that you can do multicolored prints. It's a bit like your multicolored uh, laser printer or like inkjet printer. You can possibly actually mix different colors. Uh, like all these, uh, these are like uh, low poly Pokemons. And then these are like not assembled from different parts. They are actually uh, printed all together. So it's just that the normally the 3D printer will have some special mechanism to switch between the different filaments such that it's able to alternate between the different materials and achieve what you see here. And other than FDM 3D printing, the other major 3D printing technique is resin printing. It offers very high precision at a relatively accessible cost. Like if you were to, a lot of times if you want like very fine details that cannot be achieved by FDM 3D printing, this is the technique of choice. So like, for example, if you have like a very small figurine and then their hands are like just a few millimeters thick or like maybe even less than a millimeter, a lot of times FDM, FDM 3D printing is impossible to print because if you try to print it with FDM, uh, the thing will probably break off halfway throughout the print. And then for resin printers, they have a lot more resolution compared to FDM. But then the downside is that uh, they can be quite messy. And it used to be that this kind of printing is also kind of industrial grade, but now uh, there are a lot of uh, brands coming out of like China who has like, they have like decreased the cross greatly. 
yeah and another issue with like fdm 3d printing is that there's there is generally this uh layer lines because how the fdm 3d printing works is, is layer by layer but then uh because you are like trying to squish plastic out there is a minimum height that you can go while you can like decrease the height to like something that is barely visible but the lower your layer height it means there are more layers to print and then it means a much longer uh printing time so but then for as for resin printing a lot of times the layers the layers can be very very thin as well but then because it's printing one whole layer at a time, it's like using light. So like the light can shine throughout the entire layer one shot instead of the FDM whereby the print head has to go all around the whole layer. So resin printing is a lot faster and more scalable, especially if you're like printing a lot of very small parts. Yeah, so this is like an example of like a typical uh, resin print. Uh, you see these like very funny uh, tree-like structures. This is uh, to make the print actually like possible. Like you normally wouldn't orientate uh, resin prints as how you would orientate uh, FDM prints. There are different like considerations that I will not like really get into. But then um, one disadvantage is that for resin printer, while they can give you like this kind of very high resolution, very smooth uh, finish, uh resin is quite toxic like normally when you handle the resin you wouldn't touch it with your bare hands uh if you ever handle try not to touch it with your bare hands at least wear some gloves and then after the print is done right you see this thing here right normally you still need to put it into like uh isopropyl alcohol or something to actually wash off the excess uh resin that is still on the print itself because it's still toxic. Like this process is called like washing and then you need to put it under uh, probably UV light to actually uh, cure the surface of the thing as well. And then at the very end, you need to break off all these supports. And then this support sometimes will leave behind some unwanted uh, markings on your uh, print as well. Yeah, and the last part is that uh, resin printer is slightly more expensive than uh, FDM 3D printing. It probably starts around over a thousand SGD for a decently and decently priced like entry point, uh, entry beginner kind of printer. And yeah, after introducing those two 3D printing techniques, I have some like uh, things to take note of because after all, we are like living in a physical world. We are not living in a fantasy uh, 2D anime world. Uh, uh, we can't overcome some of the physics limitations. And some of these uh, on the screen, you can see here, there are like quite a few number of like uh, limitations. So especially for things like support and overhang, so whenever you print something, right? Let's say uh, you are printing, let me think. If you're printing like, uh, imagine you're like printing a cup, like a, maybe like a glass wine kind of cup whereby you imagine there is a lake and then like the cup is like sitting on top of like the lake. And then you must make sure that your design doesn't have like a 90 degree angle kind of thing from the lake. Because if you have those kind of thing, it's almost impossible to print because if your printer tries to print in an area that is unsupported underneath, gravity will just pull your filament down and then everything will just fail. Although there are uh, currently software methods that try to overcome this kind of printing technique, like printing limitations, but then general rule of thumb is that uh, for this kind of like unsupported overhangs, uh, you shouldn't have it uh, more than steeper than like 45 degrees because anything more than 45 degrees generally would like just sloop. It will just like be too heavy and then everything will just kind of start coming down. Whereas anything within 45 degrees are still printable because you have the previous layer to support the new layer. And then there are things like, if you want to engrave like designs, you need to take into consideration your layer height as well. Like if you want to engrave like a few like characters on top of, uh, imagine you're like making a coin and then like your coin surface has like some designs and then it's like kind of engraved. So you do need to take note of like the minimum uh, depth of your uh, engraving as well. Because if your printer can, let's say only, the layer height of your printer is like, uh, maybe 0 0.2 mm. If your layer height is like 0 0.2 mm, then like your engraving needs to be at least 0 0.2 mm. If not, it will simply not show up after you print. Yeah, and similar to 
in a similar vein to like overhangs, there is another thing called like bridging. So when bridging is like the word, as the word implies, is like bridging, you're bridging from like one pillar to another pillar. There is a limited length that you can do this bridging without the middle just sagging down in, in between. So generally it's about like 10 mm for like FDM, but then for F, uh, for like SLA printing, all those kind of uh, stereolithography, uh, there isn't that much of a uh, issue with this kind of overhangs. And yeah, and other things are like tolerances. Uh, if you are designing parts that are supposed to like join together, uh, you do need to take into account like maybe the one side needs to be need to be have a little bit. Uh, more tolerance. Tolerance is like if your hole needs to be uh have a diameter of like one mm, you might want to make it a little bigger than one mm in your design because uh all these 3D printing techniques they are not exactly very very precise, but they are quite precise. They are not precise down to like nanometer scale. They are probably precise down to to millimeter scale. So if you don't take into account all these tolerances, sometimes your one meter hole might become like zero point eight millimeter and then when you try to fit anything inside it will just be stuck and like you won't be able to fit anything in and other things to take note are like the build area so if you have if you know you're going to target like a certain uh, 3d printer you know it's like build area like how the width the height the length all this you need to take into account if not uh your if your print you design a single part that is so big it might not even fit onto the build area then you can't even print it to begin with and yeah, and a lot of times when you design for FDM 3D printing, uh, make sure that you have like a solid base. As we have seen just now, if you don't have like a big enough base to print with, your print might not be able to uh, stick onto the build plate properly because uh, the first layer is the one that binds the entire print to the build plate and make sure that the print stays there throughout the entire print. So you do need to make sure that this is like there's a big enough surface area for this uh, first layer adhesion to be good. Yeah, if not, you will you might need like support material or like extra raft around the uh, first layer in order to make it printable. But those will leave like some residue behind on your print that might be quite difficult to remove. So for 3D printing, the general workflow is that once you like design it in your uh, CAD modeling software of choice, like let's say uh, Blender, you will need to export it into like a STL file or like a 3MF file. And then with this uh, 3D object file, you need to import it into your slicer. This slicer is, uh, you can think of it like a processing software. Slicer, it will... Uh, because you have a 3D object, right? What you will do is that you will slice it up into like uh something like your potato. Is like imagine you have a potato, and then like we are just slicing up into like potato chip kind of like thin slices, such that your printer will just every every layer you just take care of this printing this particular potato chip slice. And then this slicer, it's quite uh machine specific because uh. A lot of times, especially if you are using like some proprietary 3D printer, they might come with their own like special slicer with like uh, special slicing algorithms. So this part I cannot get into too much. But then there are some uh, things to take note as well. Uh, a lot of times you need to make sure that your scaling is correct. Don't happily drag your model into like the slicer and then like immediately like just slice it and then print it. Because uh, for software like Blender, because it's not designed for uh, manufacturing, sometimes your units might be off. And then uh, even if you set the units right within the Blender software, during your export process, you might not have exported it correctly as well. And then Blender, sometimes it can be problematic, like the scaling might be off. So you do need to make sure that your print is of the correct size. And then when you export your model, right? Because in... In the digital world, uh, surfaces can be like very smooth, but then at the end of the day, in computers, how we represent all these kind of surfaces is through like triangular meshes. So the thinner, the smaller your triangular mesh, the more like smooth the surface will look. But then this also means that the model will become a lot more expensive to represent. And then when your model is very uses a lot of polygons to like 
uh, represent, then the slicer might have a hard time dealing with that particular file because uh, the more triangles you have to render, then the more processing you need. And then sometimes your printer might not be able to achieve like a super high resolution. So no matter how much uh, resolution you throw into it, there's no point. It's just like, if you are trying to print on like paper, you take a printer, you give it like some incredible like uh, 3000 dots per inch, but then your printer can only do like 600 dots per inch. It's uh, like overkill and then there is no point. So after you adjust the parameters on slicer and then you send it to the printer, this will take a very long time. So in the meantime, you can probably like watch some anime while waiting for the print to finish. But then at the same time, don't forget to monitor because uh, 3D printers, quite reliable these days, but then it's still not as set and forget as like your paper printers. Your paper printers pretty much almost won't fail, but then your 3D print, there is quite a high chance that it will like fail and then you need to monitor your printer so, such that your house don't catch on fire in case that your print fail halfway, then your whole printer heats up, overheat. And then the last step is like post-processing, which I think uh, after me, there will be another short segment on it. Yeah, and another thing interesting is about like laser cutting. While we 3D printing is very powerful, laser cutting is a very cheap and dirty way to make like 2D designs. Uh, you can cut a lot of materials. You can cut wood, you can cut acrylic, you can cut foam, you can cut cardboard. It's actually usually very suitable for making uh, large objects because uh, unlike 3D printers, they normally tend, 3D printers tends to be quite small. Typical 3D printer sizes are probably uh, 20 over CM by 20 over CM with a build height of also about 20 over CM. And then if you are dealing with like uh, laser printers, laser cutters, laser cutters tend to be of like a meter scale at least. And then they are very suitable for like cutting like big weapons. And then uh, you can use them to do like etching, engraving, or like cutting. All these things actually just depend on like the power setting. If you have a very low power setting, it will barely cut through and then it will just burn the surface of the material. So you can like do some like drawing kind of thing. But then if you turn the power all the way up, it will do like, it will cut through the entire material. So that is how you can get things like all these gears. And then there are like different kinds of like uh, laser cutters, they are like fiber laser based, then they are like CO2 laser based. Those I will not really get into. Yeah, so if you don't want to shell out money to uh, buy your own like 3D printer, for like SOC students, if you are from like School of Computing, uh, makers at SOC, they do offer uh, make access to their lab and then you can use their printers for free. But then you need to first take this like uh, MIT, you don't know what course on uh, Canvas. You need to pass that thing, then you can apply for uh, card access into the place. But then to they have a lot of PLA materials that you can print with and then like printing is actually free. Or the other alternative, if you are like not from SOC and then like your faculty doesn't have all these kind of facilities, you can try to look out for maker spaces in, within your neighborhood. Uh, I think some of the libraries, they nowadays they have some sort of like a maker space in like the library. And worst case, you can always go for like paid services. So uh, I personally only used one before because like this is like the cheapest I can find, but it's still quite expensive for a print. But then if you're just starting out and then like you want to invest too much money into printing something that's just one time, you can consider all this kind of paid uh, services. And there are like somewhat cheaper alternatives on like carousel. They are like just hobbyists with like their printers at home, then they will just print for you. But then this kind is like, they might overcharge you for like the filament and whatnot. And if you can afford to wait, uh, Taobao also has some very cheap like 3D printing services. If you have a lot of things to print and then if you have a lot of things to print, but then the scale is still not big enough to use some other manufacturing techniques, then maybe Taobao is a good way for some cheap services. Yeah, and some general advice is when you try to start 3D printing, start small and then rapidly iterate and refine your design. Don't immediately come out with like your full design with like all the intricate details. You sometimes have to start small with like maybe a part of your design, try to print it out, see what is the net effect, like what's the outcome when you print it out. Because sometimes uh, some intricate details might not be feasible through, through like FDM 3D printing. Then like if you have no access to uh, resin printing, then it might be a deal breaker. You might have to consider different ways to actually design it. 
and try to modularize your design. Don't like design one whole big part and then like it sometimes might be too difficult to fit on a single build plate. Try to build it into smaller components because if you try to print a lot of things within the same build plate, right? There is a higher chance of failure. If one fails, that means the whole print will fail. But then if you break it down into components, if something fails, then uh, it's okay because you're only printing that single component then like other components are printed separately. So you're, you don't put all your eggs in a single basket. So the rule of thumb is like just to like fail fast, constantly improve. Don't go for perfection right at the start. Uh, this is unlike uh, academics. This one, you don't need to go for per perfection right at the start. And for, I've talked about quite a few number of manufacturing techniques. Uh, don't limit yourself to like a single one. A lot of times you can combine a lot of all these techniques together. Uh, all these technology are slowly improving. And then uh, when you're trying to design while you do have to take into account your ability to manufacture something, um, don't let your don't let the manufacturing technique limit what you design. Sometimes you design something that might be impossible to print now, but like maybe as software and hardware progress, you might be able to print it tomorrow. So just be creative and just use a whole combination of techniques to complement each other. Like maybe it's a big, it's a big part, you have a sword or something, maybe like the main body of the sword, you can like laser cut it and then like for the handle, then you 3D print it, something like that. And for this kind of 3D printing, the general rule of thumb is that the more you pay, the less you need to DIY. If you try to chip out, a lot of times you get what you paid for and then you sometimes have to end up uh, spending more time in order to make things work. Like your 3D printer, your cheap 3D printer might come with a lot of uh, issues that you need to fix out of the box. So if you are using 3D printing as a, like a tool as, and not as a hobby, you will need to consider shelling out a bit more for a printer that has a certain level of like quality and then they have offer a certain level of support such that if you run into issues, there is some customer support who can help you troubleshoot. So yeah, buy only if you know that you will use it frequently or like share the cost among a group of friends such that everyone can like share the printer. This is not as simple as like buying a 3D print, like a paper printer. Uh, you need like regular maintenance on your 3D printer as it's a very complicated machine with a lot of moving parts. It's part and parcel of the process. It's pretty much, 3D printing is pretty much like a hobby. It's not really a, it's, it can be a tool, but then if you own your own 3D printer, then it's really, a, you need to be ready to invest some time into it. I have listed like uh, some of the resources here. These are like the things that I have, the YouTube channels that I have like uh, somewhat regularly watched while I play around with 3D printers. There is also quite an active uh, subreddit that deals with like 3D printers. They have a lot of uh, 3D printer recommendations or this that you can look forward to. And then uh, apparently 3D printing is quite alive on like Facebook groups. There are quite a lot of Facebook communities that like deals with the different uh, 3D printing vendors. Like Creality has like a create Creality user group, and those can be quite helpful places to uh, get some help if you are buying like a cheaper printer without good support. And yeah, I think the last part is post processing and. Yeah, so I just speak in this thing. Yeah. Um. Okay, first off, I know it's like getting quite late. So if you're here for more, more for the character design part and everything, that's like all over. So my part is more for those who are planning on finishing, finishing off their project, painting, sending, making it look nice. Um, yeah, I promise you I won't take long, but uh, these pointers will save you a lot of time in the future. So at this point, you've modeled your thing, you've printed it out, it's, um, it's all ready to go, right? Not quite. Uh, the order of... We need, um, you mainly you'll be doing three things to post processor prompt. You'll be sending, painting, and assembly. These processes aren't gonna be unnecessarily in order, but um, you will have to do paint sending before you paint because that's the surface you're gonna be painting on. Okay. Uh, and if, um, by the way, your, your prop is like quite large and you broke it into multiple parts, it might be easier to uh, break it into smaller pieces, paint those, and then add it together later. And um, please, at this point, do a test fit first. There's no point in you wasting your time doing all these processes if you're going to find out later that your shit isn't going to fit together. So one of the biggest problems with 3D printing for a single, for, um, 
for props is that your single elite, your your few is deposition modeling printers, your traditional 3D printers, is going to have layer lines. So what these layer lines are, as you can see here, are these small lines that uh, are formed when you print the prop. And it may not look very, very um, pronounced when you first print it, but after you paint it, it really comes out as tarnished and quite ugly on the prints. So what's the solution to this? Sanding, or in more practically for like Singaporean houses, wet sanding because it reduces the amount of dust and has the added effect of cooling the print. The way printing works is that it melts the filament, so it doesn't like hint. It doesn't like heat. If you sand your print too hard, you generate heat, your print will melt, you lose your detail. And these problems to be, can be an extent minimized to your slicing settings. Print, your printer can be set to print smaller layers. If you tune your printer correctly, it won't wobble as much, so your differences in layer height won't be as um, pronounced. You can also make your life easy. You can also use different ways to make your life easier. You can try to skip some steps. You can add um, little, you can add fillers between the layers. So like wood putty, uh, super glue, and then adding layers of resin or super glue between sanding, between sanding runs. It will help give a very smooth finish. And uh, if you have a 3D printer, consider printing tools to make sanding easier. So this is a, this is a sanding block. It wraps, you can wrap your sandpaper around it. So it can, it's easy, it becomes easier to sand. Uh, some safety issues as well. I recommend getting a respirator. They are, they are dirt cheap on Lazada. The filters are, re are replaceable and um, it will save your lungs from a lot of powder. I experienced it myself. If you're not using PLA, if you're using ABS, you have the option of uh, vapor smoothening. So what vapor smoothening does is that you spray some acetone, you let acetone vapors melt the top layer of your print. And what this results in is a very, very smooth and glossy finish, but it's not for everything because as you can see, when you melt your print, right, you lose a lot of detail at this part. So good for some things, not, not so much others. Now, on to painting. First off, if you are into Gunpla, you've, like, you've, made your, you've painted your own like mini figurines before, you can ignore this portion because you are all way better than me. So. Priming, why prime your print? Priming helps your paint stick to the print. If you don't paint your, if you don't prime your print, right, your paint's gonna fall off the second you bring on the convention floor. You see up there? That's like a lot of work gone down the drain because my paint just flaked off. And um, for painting, you have many options. Like it's just literally painting. You can use a brush, spray. You can use your finger to paint it. I don't, I don't know. But um, yeah, just prime. Please prime your prints. Consider adding a top coat to pretend to um protect your paint job and. Use painter's tape to cover the parts you don't want to paint. Painter's tape is a better alternative to masking tape. You can find them at hardware stores. They are, it's actually cheaper than, paint, than masking tape in some cases. And it will help prevent your paint from coming off when you peel it. Finally, moving on to assembly. This at assembly portion, at the assembly portion, please, please test your electronics first. After you seal everything together, if you're not using screws or anything, this is your last step, your last chance to change your electronics and make sure everything is gonna work properly before you go on the convention floor. Uh, once you're ready, you can glue the pieces together using like one of these. I prefer using two-part epoxy, but that's because what's, that's what's readily available to me. Super glue and contact adhesive are reliable as well. Like the, there's a, there's a Excalibur floating around here that's, that's sealed using super glue, I mean, contact adhesive. You can use, when you glue your parts together, you're gonna get a seam line. So like the same test print I made, uh, you can see the seam line over here. This is when you, you, make, you send the parts, you glue them together. And then these are small round edges of each part that don't, they don't quite form a smooth surface. You can use wood putty or some other filler to fill in the gap and then sand over it and you'll get a nice smooth finish. Uh, what else? Oh, and if at this stage, like die die, you're meeting a you're meeting a project deadline, it's like 12 a.m. at the convention the night before, and you know what to do, and your things aren't fitting together, you can use a soldering iron to melt and carve your print a little bit to force everything to be fit to fit together. But that's more of a last resort. Huh? Else. And like this, this, this other technique I just discovered yesterday, you can also use a soldering iron to get a piece of filament and then you can weld your prints together. So that's quite creative and you can always sand off the seam line. So it's, I, I mean, I, I'm going to try this method the next time I make something, uh, but I'm still a newbie. So yeah, done. Just know this is, I mean, I was mainly talking about the process I used. You need to find out how to work with the resources available to you and what works for your design.
in general, I recommend like making small, like like what you, what the what he said about making starting small. You make small test prints and then test your process on those small prints, so that when you do screw up, you don't screw up your actual piece. Um, the good thing about three D printing is that if you screw up, you can just print another thing. Your work is. It's your work is reproducible. You can try over and over again until you achieve perfection. But but the way you pay, the way you pay this price is with your time. And uh, I've already been through this madness, and that's why we are here to tell you what to avoid. Anyway, um, thanks for attending the talk. Uh, in the end, cosplay is an art. Create in any medium you wish. We have left some of our props floating around. Uh, if you have any questions, you can go around and ask us. Thank you. Hello, hello. Uh, thanks for and USCAS for partnering with us today. We are really glad to see so many of you come down. Um, thank you so much. And next week we'll be having the last hacker school session, and we're holding it together with uh, NUS Game Development Club. So they'll be teaching you how to build your own first Unity game, if you're interested in that. So yeah, thanks so much for coming down. Uh, have a good night. Bye-bye.